This is my rocket. And this is a thrust vector control motor gimbal. It's the single most important mechanical component of my entire rocket. If this part isn't precise enough, which it clearly isn't currently, the whole mission could fail, and I may not manage to make this rocket guide itself with neural networks to land in a small net. So what's the strongest 3D printing material? In this video, we're going to find out. Hey everyone, and welcome back to AS Rocketry. This video is the start of my new series on how I build my rockets. Feedback would be appreciated. Thanks to Bamboo Labs for sending me this whole selection of engineering materials to test to make sure we can find out which materials I and you should be using going forward. So how do we find the best material? Well, there's several different ways the strength of a material can be measured and some of them are virtually meaningless for this gimbal. While things like tensile or pulling strength are important, for a motor gimbal, the most essential property is bending modulus, also known as stiffness. We need to minimize the deformation of the gimbal under the full force of the engine to ensure the thrust can stay pointing in the intended direction to keep the rocket under control. So how can stiffness be measured, you may ask? Well. The way it's typically measured in labs is to perform a three-point bend test. This is where a strip of plastic spans a gap supported on both ends and then has a force applied to the middle. By measuring how much deflection there is with a given amount of force, you can calculate how stiff the material is. The setup for this is unfortunately a bit out of reach for me. And so instead, I'm going to be doing a cantilever beam test. I believe this may actually offer more useful results, as it involves flexing the material in a different way to a classic three-point bend test. I'll explain more about that later. The way this works is that we fix one end of the test strip and add masses to the other, measuring how much it deflects with each. From this, we should be able to rearrange this fun equation for the deflection of a cantilever beam with a concentrated point load to find the bending modulus of the material. Now we've got a plan, it's time to get started. The way I begin all of my mechanical projects is in CAD. Here I've designed a simple cantilever beam tower to fit a 15mm wide by 2mm tall strip. This is just a very quick draft model. I don't expect it to work, but I find that being able to mess up and learn and iterate from it is one of the most valuable things about 3D printing. I've designed this tower to print in one part, to which I'll then add a couple of heat set threaded inserts to allow for the screws to clamp the strip. And then it should be good to go. All right, so it seems this test stand can definitely be improved upon. It seems a little too short and the legs aren't long enough, so with larger weights on the end, it starts to tip over. On top of this, I printed this stand itself from PET-G, which seems to be an incredibly soft and flexible plastic, so the legs themselves seem to be bending. This really isn't ideal, as it will affect the results, so I'm going to have to come up with something much sturdier. This failure gives me the perfect opportunity to experiment with something I've always wanted to do. Getting CNC machined aluminium parts. Huge thanks to JLC PCB for sponsoring this whole series. They've given me the opportunity to try out their 5-axis machining service as a complete novice. I'm going to be using this to get some experience in design for CNC, so I can hopefully use it in the future for any rocket parts that may benefit from it. Hopping back into CAD, I redesigned the stand to make it taller and have longer legs. I'm aware that machining aluminium has very different design requirements as compared to 3D printing, such as the fact that you don't have to worry about overhangs as much. Instead, you have to worry about internal corners, especially for pockets, which is a hole that doesn't go completely through. With this in mind, I've also cleaned up the design by adding rounded corners and rounding out these hexagonal cutouts in the tower. To help with machining costs, I've decided to split the tower into two pieces like this. The leg section is now a separate piece, 
which slides into the main tower section with this dovetail joint. As a little experiment, I've left these corners sharp, as I'd like to see how they handle it. Ultimately, it's factors like this which could be make or break for using CNC for my rocket parts in the future. I've left typical 3D printing tolerances of about 0.25mm on each side around this, just to see how oversized that really is. I've also decided to test the thread tapping service. For this, I've added a couple of M3 bolts to lock the dovetail joint together. Also, I've designed it to have the threads for the screws to clamp the plastic strip be machined directly into the tower. Ordering the parts was incredibly simple, even for someone like me who's never done any machining before. I've just uploaded the stab files, along with a technical drawing to show how I want the holes tapped, which my CAD software generated for me. I've chosen to go with 6061 aluminium with bead blasting and champagne anodizing. Thanks again to JLC PCB for sponsoring this series. If you'd like to order anything from PCBs to 5-axis CNC machining, you can use my link in the description to get coupons, which can be used across any of their services. And just wow, look at these parts. The internal corners on the dovetail are perfectly sharp. I'm guessing they use something like wire EDM. Machinists, feel free to correct me in the comments. Putting it together, it's clear my 3D printing tolerances were way too loose for the precision of CNC machining in the dovetail joint, leaving it with a ton of wiggle room. Luckily, it seems the bolts can knock it down solidly, so I don't think this is going anywhere. I think this has been a huge success, so I'd love to use this in the future. If you'd like to see me try to make a machined aluminium or 3D printed titanium motor gimbal in the future, or if you have any other ideas of what I could do with this, leave a comment and I might try using it. Now I've got the test stand set up, we can finally get some real results. I've printed a couple of test strips out of each of the materials, printed like this, flat on the build plate with standard settings. I'll talk more about the requirements for printing each individual material a bit later. Here's the process I'm using to test them, for which I'm using PET CF to demonstrate. First, I put the test strip into the slot and ensure it's pushed all the way to the back of the cavity to ensure the lever arm is always the same for every material before I clamp it in. Second, I put the weight holder onto the other end of the strip and measure the height from my desk to the front bottom corner of the holder and record this as the zero position. Third, I add a small mass to the holder and then measure the new position after it stopped moving. I'll repeat this, adding more weights and keep recording the deflection for each. Finally, I'll flip the strip and repeat everything. Taking an average of both orientations should help cancel out any directional biases. Here's the data from PLA Basic. It looks very linear which is definitely a good sign. If I wanted to just compare between my own test, this arbitrary deflection per force value would be good enough. However, I also want to compare my results to the ones from both the datasheet to see if I'm getting the expected values as well as other materials. Because of this, I need to properly calculate the flexural modulus. By rearranging the formula from earlier, we can get that the bending modulus, E, is equal to the load, times the load distance squared over 6 times the area moment of inertia. All of that is then multiplied by 3 times the total length minus the load distance, A. To calculate the area moment of inertia, we can just use the formula I is equal to B times H cubed divided by 12, where B is the width, 15 millimeters, and H is the height, 2 millimeters. Conveniently, everything here in my setup is a constant, other than the maximum deflection. This means that I can substitute in any values and bring it all down to a constant, making it so that the bending modulus of a given strip can be calculated by just taking 60,231,600 over the deflection for my setup. Taking the data from PLA, this gives a calculated bending modulus of about 2.1 gigapascals. This is significantly below the value of 2.5 gigapascals listed on the technical datasheet for XY bending modulus, 
and instead much closer to the y value. This conveniently brings up something important to mention. The strength of 3D printed parts vary a lot by print orientation, with xy being vastly stronger than the layer stacking direction, especially for the fiber filled composites, which I'll come on more in a bit. First, I need to print off the test strips from all the other materials and finish the testing. While I'm on the topic of printing with each of the materials, here's a quick breakdown of their different requirements. Some materials like PLA and PETG can be printed in both open and closed air printers, with PLA even printing better with open frame. Other materials like nylons can require an enclosed chamber to prevent warping. Beyond that, the ideal scenario can even go as far as wanting an actively heated chamber, which my printer doesn't have. However, this shouldn't make too much of a difference to the results as these strips are printed flat on the build plate and I haven't had any issues with any of the materials for printing larger parts that aren't just on the bed. Also, another difficulty is that many of the materials, again, primarily the nylons, require drying them before you can even print. This varies in difficulty a lot, from PETG requiring a measly 60 degrees, all the way up to PPA requiring over 140 celsius just to dry it. Among other requirements, like the need to use glue sticks, it all adds up to make these engineering materials increasingly less ideal. However, when following the requirements closely, they do all print perfectly on the default profiles in my stock Bamboo Labs P1S. And again, that's not sponsored. I bought this printer with my own money, however, I do have an affiliate link in the description if you'd like to get one of the printers for yourself and you'd like to support me. Here's the graph of all the materials, and as you can see, while PLA isn't the strongest in its pure printed state, it's definitely not the weakest. In fact, from my test, I'd argue that it can even outperform some of the significantly more expensive materials like PHTCF. Now, the reason I think it's causing all the carbon fiber engineering materials to underperform significantly compared to the data sheet is that what I'm testing is actually a combination of both XY bending and Z bending. The way carbon composite filaments work, you only actually get the fibers reinforcing within the layers. I assume that the three point bend test that is typically used to test these materials better isolates the gain performance in the XY plane. However, I'd argue that if my test doesn't actually experience the benefit from carbon fiber, it's probably not a good idea to assume real world cases will be any better. With this in mind, I'm still shocked that the carbon fiber not only doesn't help the stiffness of PETG, but actually makes it significantly softer than the high flow counterpart. I definitely recommend avoiding this material, as it doesn't seem to have any upside other than a nicer surface finish. However, I should say, it's not all bad, the carbon fibers do actually serve an important purpose during printing, as they stabilize the material to prevent common print issues like stringing or warping. I've noticed that basically all of these materials were significantly easier to print than I was expecting, especially PET and PPA. While some of them do require blast drying before you can print with them, the actual printing experience is extremely pain free, especially on an enclosed printer. However, I have seen it is actually possible to print PET CF on open air printers, so that could be worth a shot. Now, which of these materials do I actually recommend using? And which am I using myself going forwards? Well, I'd immediately eliminate PETG and PETGCF. Since they're softer than PLA, next I have to eliminate fiberglass PA6, as it's, from my experience, just a worse version of its carbon fiber brother. However, I do actually think I've got a use for it, which I'll probably be showing off in the future video. Next, of course, I have to eliminate PHTCF for being worse than PLA basic. However, again, it does have a few uses, especially that it's basically the only engineering composite that can be used in Bamboo's automatic material systems. Next up on the chopping block is PLA carbon fiber. It's more than 50% more expensive than plain PLA basic, yet again, as with all carbon fiber filaments, barely outperforms PLA in my testing so it's effectively just a cosmetic upgrade. So that just leaves these four remaining materials. 
but there's one more I personally wouldn't recommend, PA6CF. In my experience, it's significantly more of a pain to work with than PET-CF, less temperature resistant, more brittle, and just in general, not the best experience. For comparison, PET is significantly better in, as far as I can tell, every way while being close enough to the same price, and being printable on open frame printers, is also stiffer than PA6 and has far less problems with warping. Also, you don't have to worry about dry versus wet properties like you do with nylons, and the list just goes on. So ultimately, sorry guys, but I have to eliminate what, at least from what I have seen from other people, is the gold standard engineering material. I just don't believe it lives up to its reputation at all. At least not for my gimbals. We've made it. Here's the three materials I'd actually recommend, and just a bit of extra explanation as to why. First up, PLA Basic. It's cheap, it's relatively stiff, it's one of the easiest materials to print on basically any printer. The one downside it does have is heat resistance. However, from my experience of using it directly in contact with my rocket engines, it actually holds up surprisingly well. Quick side note for PLA, I'm also doing some side experiments with the possibility to crystallize it, as I believe it may actually be possible to significantly increase the stiffness and temperature resistance. Unfortunately, the process typically causes warping. However, I do actually have an idea of how to crystallize PLA prints without warping. But to test it, I'd need to get a Bamboo Lab H2D, so if you'd like to see that, please comment below to help me justify getting one. Next, the good middle ground is PET CF. It's almost double the stiffness of PLA, significantly higher temperature resistance, still easy to print, and can be bought in 500 gram spools, so it's not too much of an investment. The best bit is that unlike the other engineering materials, it can actually be printed on just about any printer with a hardened nozzle and extruder gear, enclosed or not. I haven't tried crystallizing PET, but if you'd like to see me attempt crystallization on all these materials, again, comment, and maybe I can try it out. And finally, PPA-CF. It's undeniably the top dog. Running laps around the stiffness of PLA, it's just in a league of its own. I've been shocked at how easy to use it's been. I've had no warping or bubbling, or any problems like that at all. But then again, ultimately, I did have to buy a whole convection oven just to dry it out before I could even use it. It's certainly not for everyone, but if you've got the budget and an enclosed printer for it, you can definitely benefit from it. Ultimately, I think for parts where stiffness matters, these are all solid choices to stick to. And it's down to your individual budget, and capabilities, and requirements for which one you want to stick with. For me, I'm making this rocket to be the best I can possibly make it. So, since I've now got a couple spools of this PPA, and it's such a joy to use, I certainly know which one I'll be sticking to. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you liked it, like. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you'd like to support the project, my Buy Me A Coffee is linked in the description. I'll see you all in part two where I show you a bit more detail about my actual electronics design process, using my new flight computer as an example.